Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with David Yarnold, President and CEO of the National Audubon Society. The Society's mission is to conserve and restore natural ecosystems by focusing on birds, other wildlife, and their habitats for the benefit of humanity and biodiversity. A Pulitzer Prize winning former editor of San Jose Mercury News, David Yarnold helped double revenue at Environmental Defense and also led its political action arm. He has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, David, for joining us today. Thanks, Mark. It's a pleasure to be with you. Audubon is one of the oldest, most known, certainly renowned of the environmental conservation organizations in the United States and has an international reputation. Tell us about this renowned organization, its genesis, and where it stands today. So its story is actually uh, that of the first real social network. A group of women, predominantly women, aligned themselves around the idea that it was just horrible to shoot birds to use their feathers for hats, millinery, and for clothing. And so they took up that cause, and in the early teens, Congress passed legislation to ban the slaughter of birds for millinery. So Audubon grew up as a series of chapters, and today we have 470 chapters across the country. We have 50 educational centers that serve a million people. We have offices in 23 states. We have in Washington a policy office. We have an international program where we work uh, in eight countries across the Americas. We have a large education division, and we have a significant citizen science uh, program in D.C. So all told, Audubon is this great old brand that we spent the last couple of years reinvigorating and uh, turning around and um, infusing with a new mission. Let's leapfrog history for a bit. Let's talk about how you view your, the scope of your work today. It's not about hats anymore, is it? <laughs> it's, it's about uh, conserving habitat. It's about bringing people to ecosystems through birds. Birds are the most charismatic species on the planet, the most abundant wildlife. There are 20 billion birds on the planet. They're the most accessible wildlife, whether you live in a city or uh, in a country or you're visiting a jungle or, or, or a seacoast. Um, and they are terrifically charismatic creatures. So our mission today is to engage people in conservation and education, and birds are the way that we bring them to that. So the way that we're organized is actually really interesting. We follow birds to our work. There are four superhighways uh, above the skies in the Americas, and these superhighways are called flyways. Underneath these superhighways, the Pacific, the Central, the Mississippi, and the Atlantic, underneath those superhighways in the sky, there are rest stops and homes. And there are about 2,500 of those that are identified and called important bird areas. Those are places like Long Island Sound and the Everglades and California's Central Valley. And if you connect those 2,500 places, what you have is this web of biodiversity that's really our natural heritage. Our job is to protect the tipping points. And the wildlife that, that sits along that, uh, those flyways, the connections between those birds and the health of, those, uh, of that wildlife is, is direct. Sure. So whether you're talking about a wood thrush on the East Coast or you're talking about uh, a, a, an Arctic tern on the West Coast, each of those birds is really, so it's about that bird and that species, but they're also a metaphor. They're a window into an ecosystem, the, the canary flora, and the, the fauna. The canary in the coal mine. Right, the canary in the coal mine. And, and birds, bird, if you follow birds and you, and you look at what's around them, you see, as you said, you see the plant life, you see other creatures, you see where the animal, where, where birds fit into ecosystems. And you talk about birds being a charismatic and accessible species. We all experience birds. While we might want to protect polar bears, we don't experience polar bears in the wild. We do experience birds in the wild. Sure, and you, can, uh, you can't take your kid into your backyard to show them a polar bear but you can give them a pair of fairly cheap binoculars and see up close what the wing structure looks like on a house sparrow or a wren or uh, a any number of birds, depending on where you live. It's a great way to get kids connected to the environment and to conservation. Uh, talk about the range of programs that you offer. So 
uh, I have this terrible, this terrible um, metaphor that, that Audubon has this unparalleled wingspan that we can work, I'm sorry, it's a bad metaphor. I'm, lo- I'm open to a better one. We'll so, forgive you, we'll forgive you, just this once. So, so we can work from people's backyards all the way to the halls of Congress and in legislatures up and down the hemisphere. So we have a program called Audubon at Home where you can change the kinds of plants you have in your backyard, you can attract more birds, there. you can use native species, um, less fertilizer, it's better for your kids, it's better for your pets. Um, that program in different states in some states, it's about changing the habitat at schools. Right. In some states, it's about public parks. So we can work at the neighborhood and community level. And at the national level, this year, we had three victories, any of which would have kept a national conservation organization going for a full year. So just briefly, one was the first set of guidelines about where to put wind power. Now, who but a bird organization, who but the voice of birds, is more qualified to talk about where to put bird blenders, right? right? So we worked with the wind industry and the interior department and other nonprofits to help issue the first set of guidelines about where can you, where should we put wind power, because we believe that it's important to deploy renewables and to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. So, uh, but go back to your to your um, your reference to bird blenders, yep. because not everybody will will know what you mean by that. Yeah. So wind turbines are um, depending on where wind turbines are sited, where where they're put. Um, they can be really bad for birds or minimally bad for birds. Uh, and so we worked with the federal government and the wind industry to find the places where wind turbines will produce renewable power and do minimal or no damage to birds and to their habitat. So that was one huge victory. A second one is uh, the passage of the Restore Act. The Restore Act will send up to 80 percent of BP's penalties to the five Gulf Coast states that were most hammered by the Gulf spill. And we were one of the three NGOs that worked on that legislation. And it's a huge victory for restoring coastal Louisiana, which is the fifth largest delta on the planet. It's America's delta system. And the kind of money that's going to be devoted to that is of the scale that's needed to actually restore that amazing habitat. The third victory was in Alaska, where the National Petroleum Reserve, which is 30 plus million acres, has been awaiting a plan for what part can be developed and what part needs to be preserved. Well, Audubon's really humbled and really proud of the fact that basically the map that we drew with and for the Interior Department was adopted to preserve more than 11 million acres in the National Petroleum Reserve. All of those are major landscape scale wins for conservation. So Audubon works at a really large scale, and we work in people's backyards. What's really interesting to me is how you triangulate amongst interests. Talk about how you do that. Yeah, so we actually have this amazing army of uh, uh, data gatherers. So Audubon has the ability uh, and the history of gathering data every year. Um, we use crowd science or citizen science to do that. That's one way that we do that. We use other sophisticated um, uh, types of data as well, satellite imagery and, and, and whatnot. But and it's in your DNA, this collection of information. So for more than 100 years, Audubon has run this thing called the Christmas Bird Count. Every year in the holiday season, for a month, people fan out across America. Somewhere around 70,000 people go out and count birds in the same place that they've counted them for more than 100 years. And, and that data is, is incomparable. It is the longest running, largest animal census on the planet. And Audubon's really proud to have its name on that. You're, you're actually connecting with other people and pulling your data in with others' data and, and their resources in order to achieve these, these types of effects. There's almost nothing that we can do alone. Um, in fact, if we were to list all of our partners in our annual report, it would be five pages long. So uh, we share that data with land use planners, with people who are looking at climate change modeling, with people who are looking at um, energy extraction, um, with forest managers. We've developed, Gary Langham, our chief scientist, has developed uh, this climate modeling where he's used bird data to predict the habitat that is most worth preserving 
even in the case of the worst effects of climate change. So if you're a land use planner, if you're a forester, if you care about habitat, what, what will you choose to protect over the next 80 years? Wouldn't you like to have some guidance about what habitat you'll have no regrets about protecting? Well, the Fish and Wildlife Service wanted that kind of data, and we're sharing it with 12 of their regional bodies, and we have just released that report nationally. We'll be sharing that nationally over the next uh, few years. Now, you came to uh, Audubon from Environmental Defense, a completely different organization focusing on clear, clean air, uh, water, and land. What was the thing that attracted you to Audubon? Environmental Defense was a, a great five-and-a-half-year education. And uh, Audubon was attracted to me because of the community-based work, because of the grassroots, because I, as, as you um, so kindly referred to in your introduction, I have a, a, a history of doing community-based journalism. Right. So being able to work with people in California Central Valley or in the upper Mississippi and Minnesota on, on the prairies or down in Texas on the coastline, being able to work with people about protecting those places and at the same time, connecting them by the flyways to something larger, to me that felt like coming home. It felt really natural to me to come back to that community-based work. And Audubon's grassroots is what makes us really special. It seemed to me that for a period of time, Audubon's brand had become a bit, um, a bit tired. Um, it, it, had, it had been around for a long time. And um, I, I wonder whether your media background um, and your connection to the, to the challenge of communicating value and communicating complex uh, messages might have also been useful to the organization at this point in its history. Now, I don't think there's any question that a lot of um, conservation work is about communicating in a way that people understand. It's also about listening, which is another skill that good journalists have, and, right. and every now and then I'm able to actually bring it to, uh, to, to focus. Um, understanding people's ways of life, whether they live in Charleston, South Carolina, or down on the bayou in Louisiana, and listening to their values, and having Audubon be a, a bipartisan, nonpartisan um, entity that's trusted uh, is a, a core strength. So we built some programs on top of that that came, I think, in, in no small part from my communications background. Uh, the example that uh, I would share with you is a, a project that we've, uh, we've rolled out during the 2012 election season called Conservation Has No Party. And the reason we did it is because, like a lot of other leaders of green groups, you know, I'm just tired of conservation being a political football. I am just sick and tired of the issue being politicized. But instead of sitting around and, and bemoaning the fact that um, so many conservationists live in blue states, um, what we said was, let's appeal to the conservationists in red states because we know that many people who call themselves conservatives or moderates actually believe that conservation and energy extraction are, um, uh, are not mutually exclusive. So we launched this campaign and more than 120,000 people signed a pledge that said, we support these five key uh, approaches um, and we believe that conservation doesn't have a party. So those people now become part of our action network and our ability to reach into red states is one of the things that makes Audubon different. So is that a part of my communications background? Yeah, I think so. So you talked a little bit about revitalizing Audubon and Audubon's online and social media presence uh, up until a couple of years ago was pretty meager. And now we've experimented, we experiment on a regular basis with all sorts of new ideas. A couple of years ago, we started a, a, a new initiative uh, called Birding the Net, where we let birds loose all over the internet. There were birds on more than 100 different websites, and what you got to do as a game player was to go find them. It was a scavenger hunt. So more than 10,000 people played, and the winner was a non-birder, a, a marketing executive from Boston, a young woman, <laughs> who now is a birder. Um, and so having the ability to bring people together uh, through social media is a huge opportunity that we've just started to tap. How do these kinds of changes affect the organization that you're shaping now? I think the, I, I, I think 
the primary way that it's aff affected the organization is that people are much more aware of their ability to communicate with each other. Uh, the Audubon Network, and this was really the big aha for me as we wrote a new strategic plan, and as I got to, to know Audubon, um, is that it really was a network waiting to be glued together. And I think, I know, that people are really excited about the idea that they live in a flyway and that the birds that visit them, um, that the bobolink that's in uh, the prairies of, of, of Illinois may well be down in Argentina in the winter. Um, so it's not uncommon to have the leader of a chapter say to me, and they always use the same gesture because it's about the flyways, they always say, I can hook into something larger than myself. You know, and, and I think that satisfies some deep human need to feel that you belong to something larger than just you. And doesn't it create the instantaneous connection between the birder or the uh, person who is concerned about their ecosystem in Argentina? Oh, it does. And in fact, um, I, I, I was at a, an event at the Organization of American States. It was a very formal event. And the Secretary General of the Organization of American States, who was from Brazil, said, we want to thank you for taking care of our birds during the winter. And, you know, and we think about it uh, j just the opposite. The opposite, the yeah. opposite way. Yeah. In terms of, of the organization's uh, funding and finances, how does that work? You have a, a tremendous amount of activity that you're engaged in. Um, and one assumes that you must have a very sophisticated uh, financial model. Uh, could you just describe a bit about how that part of it works? Sure. So we, uh, our, our fundraising comes from membership. Right. Um, we have more than 400,000 paying members. Um, our states fundraise, our centers fundraise, um, and our chapters fundraise. So all together, we raise $65, $68 million a year. There's another $18 to $20, $20 million a year in, uh, in revenues from uh, reserves and from uh, investments. Um, and, and it's growing. Um, what we see is, is our, mes our message resonating. We see people beginning to understand something really fundamental about Audubon. And I constantly have to remind myself that when I'm talking to people about Audubon, they're thinking, these guys promote bird watching. That's what they're thinking. And uh, <laughs> that's when they don't confuse us with the German highway company. Right, right. right. Um, and so I was talking with a friend of mine recently, and he said, so wait a minute. So you have policy experts and scientists who write and execute large-scale conservation plans? And I said, yeah, that's what we do. He said, I thought you were a bird watching club. So, well, that speaks to the, to the question of what is the return on investment of a, uh, for a member? So between our membership and our action network, we're close to about three quarters of a million people who um, affiliate with us. And why do they choose to do that? I think because uh, uh, several reasons. One, um, a sense of community. They may well get together to go hiking. They may well get together to work on land use issues. They may well get together to promote educational programs for kids. All of those things happen inside the Audubon network. So I think that there is um, a, a sense of community, at, you know, and that is another appetite, I think, that, that, that Audubon helps satisfy. I think in addition to that, there's the affinity with the brand. Right. There's just this sense that we must be doing something good for birds and for habitat. And then for, for a significant and growing portion of our members, they recognize that we have political muscle. And, and when you're talking about the, a, a large-scale project like rebuilding coastal Louisiana, preserving 11 million acres in Alaska, if you could help make that happen, um, then you you know you've you've made a real contribution to preserving a very special piece of the planet you were born on and that you're going to leave to others. So the part of the value is what you experience. It's no different than attending a concert or attending a film or attending an event. You're experiencing something. You're experiencing community. You're experiencing the outdoors with people. You're exchanging information. You're investing in something that you really treasure. 
And then the other piece is impact. You are uniting with that community to create something that is bigger than yourself. Uh, that's absolutely right. And that, that, uh, that your point about experience says to me that it's, it's critical that we share information and ask for advice. I uh, strongly uh, suspect that a lot of the dialogue that goes on internally is about how do you convey that value, how do you increase the level of satisfaction of the experience of interacting with, with Autobahn, isn't it? So one of the things that we're focused on right now is building the bird content on our website. Our advocacy content, our science content, our education content, you know, it, it, it's terrific. But we actually had forgotten to build bird content, so we're doing that right now. But that's just one example of what we're doing in terms of communications. What we mostly are doing is talking more often about what our chapters are doing, what our states are doing, how our educational centers are reaching uh, kids in some of the most diverse communities in America, you know, from East LA to Appalachia. Uh, and, and I don't know where that goes, but I, I believe that by sharing that information um, and by asking for ideas from people who come to Audubon through birds, that we're gonna come up with ideas and, and leverage our, our, our members and our friends in a way that you know, goes far beyond anything we can do as staff. And your members and friends are not just restricted to uh, the United States, North America, or even the Americas. Your reach is quite a bit broader than that. So we are the uh, U.S.-based partner for a large organization called Bird Life International, which is an umbrella of 118 bird-based uh, nonprofits around the planet. And we are primarily responsible for the work across the Americas. So we work in eight Latin American countries from Panama to Belize, uh, and uh, we do that because in order to preserve birds across their life cycle, in order to help birds build an air bridge right. from here to where they migrate, the, ha the half of the birds in the U.S. who are smart enough to go south for the winter, <laughs> um, we need to be able to work in those countries as well. And that's a partnership that's still relatively new, and it's building. Virtually everything about Audubon right now is on a building curve. Um, and I, I'm excited to have people join us on that curve. Well, the model that you've created out of, out of this small circle of visionary women who were thinking about the effects of their own personal behavior on everyone else to the, the growth of this organization and the work that it has done through history to now this next step in which you're talking about full flyways, the habitats, the rest stations, how do you ensure that the experience of birds is safeguarded so that that habitat is not disrupted and has a catastrophic effect on both habitat and on, on birds and on, on our lives. You are just at, a, at an amazing inflection point and I, I'm so looking forward to seeing what the next five years brings for Audubon. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for your insights. Thank you so much.